Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host Rommel Gassain and today we have with us Jay Smith who will be discussing with us the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First of all, welcome to the show Jay. Thank you. I mean this is a really important question for Muslims and non-Muslims. Isn't that right? I would say it's a much more important question for non-Muslims. Not so important for Muslims for okay. a very good reason. As we saw in the earlier episode when we were talking about the crucifixion, that's the problem for Muslims. Uh, mm. They don't believe Christ died on the cross. They believe another took his place. So they stop there. They can't get past that point. Well, that's not that they cannot get past. They don't even see the reason for it. Of course he was alive. There was no resurrection because he never died. Mm. So it's superfluous to even bring it up. They have no doubt that he was seen after uh, the crucifixion because the crucifixion wasn't him. Someone else died on the cross. That's for certain. There was a person that died. If it wasn't him, it stands to reason that he was walking and talking all over that place. Okay. Uh, if 500 saw him, well, yes, they would expect 500 to see him. So the resurrection doesn't even come into their question. It doesn't even come into their discussion. So just on that point, what do Muslims believe about Jesus Christ? How did his life end? They believe he was taken up. Okay. They so believe he was taken up. They don't know when, they don't know what, but certainly it was after. And they wouldn't even have a, they wouldn't have a difficulty with believing that uh, he was taken up as we see in Scripture. And he'll come again a second time. So he never died? He never died. No. Okay. And it was, it's when he comes back a second time. And that's why in Surah 19, Ayah 33, where it says, Blessed be me the day I was born, the day I die, that dying will happen the second time. Okay. When he comes back a second time. Then he will rise. So the resurrection for them comes yet in the future. It's a future uh, re uh, reference point. And he certainly didn't die back then 2,000 years ago. And he didn't rise from death 2,000 years ago. Uh -huh. So then how do we evidence the resurrection? Well, the resurrection, the evidence for the resurrection, most Christians know this. Uh, you, you learn it in Bible school, you learn it in seminary, there's lots of references. And what I want to do is go through the eight classical defenses for the resurrection. These are not my material. This is material that you would learn. I'm sure you already know these, Rommel. People who are watching, I'm sure they've heard this. This is nothing new. And the first one uh, refers to the Old Testament. The Old Testament speaks about it. Uh, and there are three classic verses in the Old Testament, Psalm 22, Psalm 69, and Isaiah 53, that refer to both a death and resurrection. Let me just unpack that a little bit more. If you look at Psalm 22, verse 1 to 21, uh, it talks about the agony and the desolation, that the servant of God will be, go through agony and desolation. That's the death. Uh, verse 22 to 31 then talks about deliverance and faithfulness. So it infers then that this one who goes through agony and desolation then uh, is delivered and is faithful. In Psalm chapter 69, verse 1 to 29, we see the, this suffering man and his death. There is the reference to him first dying. And then from verse 30 to 36, we see praise and triumph. So this man who then dies, this suffering man that dies, is then uh, resurrected with praise and triumph, inferring that there's two different stages to his life. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 to 9, probably the most classical uh, reference to the death of Jesus. In fact, it's known as the suffering servant uh, uh, chapter. Verse 1 to 9 talks about the suffering and the sacrifice of this servant who's coming to bear our sins. With his stripes we will be healed. That's very clear that the Messiah this would be a suffering servant. But then verse 10 and 11 that come immediately after says that this servant would see his offspring which implies that he would be alive again. Yes. So there you see both the death and the resurrection. That his days would be prolonged and he will see the fruit of his labors. So the suffering servant who does die, yet will rise again to see his, his offspring and he will be, he have a prolonged days and he will see the fruit of his labors. So those are the three classic verses in the Old Testament that talk about the death and resurrection. That's the first probably defense. The second defense would be the New Testament references where Jesus refers to it in his ministry. And there's a number that I could go to. I'm just going to pick four uh, that are probably the better known. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21, he, Jesus speaks about his death, uh, his coming death. So he infers it. He's very clear about it to the Pharisees there at the temple. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, he is on his way to Jerusalem. He then talks about his death there as well. So there's a uh, a, a reference before he dies of what he is going to do. In Ma Mark chapter 8, verse 31, at Peter's confession, he then refers to the fact that he has to die. 
And then in Mark chapter 14, verse 28, at the Mount of Olives, he prays about it. So certainly Jesus in the New Testament knew that he was going to die. Mm. He knew that this is what his whole ministry was about. This was not a surprise to him. It was a surprise to the disciples, and many of them didn't know what he was talking about until after he died and rose again. Then suddenly all these references made sense. And it certainly wasn't a secret or a coincidence. No. Not only does it fit the Old Testament pattern, it fits Jesus' own ministry. The third evidence is what we call the historical record, the evidence from historical record uh, that, that Christ did die is well known. We talked about it in the previous episode on the crucifixion. So this is extra biblical evidence, extra so things, biblical. sources outside of the Bible yeah. which confirm... Yeah, Thallus yes. and Phlegon debating this event in 52 AD, 20 years after Christ's death. Uh -huh. They're both Greek. They are, they are not Christians, yet they do have no difficulty believing that was Jesus on the cross. And then they say, uh, the Thalysen says that at that day, on that day, the earth shook and the sun went dark, mm. which parallels and supports what we see in the gospel evidence. Uh, Tacitus, a Roman historian, hated Christians, but yet he was very clear that that was Jesus on the cross, even gives us the date happened under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. That's why we know it was 33 AD, because of Tacitus. And then probably the best reference, the best evidence we have, not only for the death but the resurrection, comes from a Jewish source from Josephus, the Jewish historian, living in Rome uh, about 50 to 60 years after the, uh, the death and resurrection. He not only mentions it, but he also infers that the Christians believe he rose again. Now. Many people say this was probably added on at a much later date. The problem is they have the same problem with any historian. Mm -hmm. We don't have the original uh, uh, copies for any of the earliest historians. We have to go at, on point that certainly Josephus is not saying that he believes that Christ rose again. He's saying that Christians believe Christ rose again. If someone had wanted to concoct it or someone would have wanted to doctor it, they would have said he believed it. Yes. The fact that they don't, the fact that he says, it is not my belief, this is what these Christians believe. And that adds a little bit more weight. Yes. It adds an awful lot more weight yeah. because that's what you would expect a Jewish historian to write mm. uh, who would not be privy to that knowledge. It's just something secondhand for him. So you have the historical record that supports the death Resurrection uh, from the context of Josephus. But probably the biggest, and probably the strongest evidence is the empty tomb, uh, the fourth category. Stop and ask yourself, if Jesus did not die and rise again, then why did somebody go and show the body? That would have been the most simple thing. Why didn't anybody, from in the last 2,000 years, why didn't the J Romans or the Jewish uh, priests, why didn't they just go and show where the body was? Yes. Why is it that nobody to this date has ever found the body? The tomb has always remained empty. Now stop and think. Look at the scenario we're talking about. We know that the tomb was a regular tomb. We know that the tomb uh, would have, in classic, um, classic period, at that time period, it would have been a tomb that had a big stone over the entrance. Some say as heavy as two tons. Joseph Arimathea, he was a very rich man. He was, uh, he was a Christian at that time. He allowed Jesus to be buried in his tomb. Very unlike the tombs that we have today. Absolutely. Which, which simply, it's you know, six feet under, uh, dug into the ground. This was more like a cave. It's a cave. Yes. And the two-ton stone would have been rolled on a, uh, a, a, um, a gully that would come down. So you would take out the stopper okay. and it would just, it would take like quite a, a few minutes to let it roll yes. down the track and it would just roll over the over the, um, uh, the face of the cave to keep grave robbers at bay. Mm -hmm. Especially this one, they didn't want anybody to steal the body. It was very clear that they did not want an empty tomb. They did not want to have anybody suggesting that he was going to rise again because that they knew that this is what they, this is what was prophesied. So even the Jews knew this. So they, put, they made sure that this stone was sealed, tons, and it, they sealed it as well. They put a seal all around it. What's more, uh, they put 16 Praetorian guards. Now, the Praetorian guards are the creme de la creme of the Roman legions. These are not men to trifle with. <laughs> and as you have 16 guards broken up into four groups, according to what we know about Roman tradition, Three of the groups would have been around the outside. They would probably, most of them would have been laying down or resting. One group of four would always be in front of the tomb and they would take a rota. One would then stay for a certain amount of hours, then the next would come over and take their place. The next, So that you'd always have four standing at attention. It's almost humorous to think. I mean, here they are protecting a dead body in a tomb. Uh, this is like an armor guard. I mean, you'd probably wouldn't even have that much protection nowadays for a bank. 
Yeah. When you think about it, it's almost and, humorous. That's right. And the fact that they wanted all this protection seemed to suggest that they were th thinking that maybe their disciples would have stolen the body. Yes. And that's why the rumor that they put out, they had to put a rumor out because why? Well, when the two-ton stone was thrown out, now remember, in the scriptures it says that it was thrown away. It was not something that just rolled away. Can you imagine one man who had been crucified, had all this done to his body, throwing away a two-ton stone? No way. Can you imagine also breaking the seal, which is a big rope that is sealed on either side? And then can you imagine overpowering 16 guards of the finest Roman legions? You would need a small army. You would need a small army. <laughs> yes. But what would happen to a Praetorian guard if he ever went to sleep at, at guard? Do you know what the, the punishment is? No, what's that? They would take their clothes, make them stand on their clothes, and then burn them to death. Wow. Light the clothes up with gas, with fire, sorry, um, uh, petrol, or oil, sorry. Let's get the right term. Oil for that period. And he would have to burn to death, a terrible death. Every Praetorian guard would never sleep at their post. That would be the one thing they would never do. Because yes. it's a capital offense. Yes. That's why they didn't go back to their, their, their base. Who did they go to? They immediately went to the chief priests. Okay. Why would Roman guards go to the chief priests? Because they needed an alibi. Mm. They needed a, a reason. And that's why the chief priest says, tell them that the disciples stole the body. Now that wouldn't really get them out of hock. And you can see that this, yeah. their arms, they had an awful lot to answer for. But to stop and ask yourself, and I remember there, uh, there was an article that came out a number of years ago that stipulated that the, the penalty for stealing a body after the first century suddenly became a capital offense. Before the first century, it was so many denarii. It was a price that was, you had to pay. After the first century, it became a capital offense. Why suddenly did they put a capital offense in in the first century? Unless there was a precedent. Yes. And so historians are saying, what would have been the precedent that would have been that great that would cause the penalty to be okay. uh, increased to such I a see. level? Yes. Unless, of course, it was Jesus. Yes. It was the resurrection of Jesus that started that precedence. What's fascinating is you have that empty tomb. And to this day, we can ask everybody, if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead, provide the body. The right. empty tomb is probably the strongest argument. Uh, it was the strongest argument at the time, at the time of the disciples. See, some people might say, well, maybe they got mixed up when they went, they went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> Don't you think Joseph of Arimathea would have known the right tomb? That's right. <laughs> I know some people believe that they were, they, they, they were drugged. And they were drunk. And so when they went to look for the tomb, they couldn't find it. You know, all these excuses that you hear are superfluous when you stop and think of the enormity of what had happened. Yes. I know that the group called the Ahmadiyya, they believe that Jesus just swooned. And that when he swooned, they took him off thinking he was dead. They put him into the tomb, closed up the stone, let it roll down, two-ton stone. And then they put the 16 Praetorian guards. And then suddenly, in the middle of the night, he wakes up from his wounds, realizes where he is, throws off the two-ton stone, overpowers the 16 guards, and then walks off and goes all the way to Kashmir, and then dies in Kashmir. And I have to, have to laugh almost when you stop and think of, the, you, of the, enor the enormity of what they're trying to say. Well, you'd need a lot of faith to believe that. Well, a lot of blind faith. I'm not sure it would be faith or blind faith. <laughs> I'll use another word we don't want to do yeah. tonight. But it's certainly th uh, these excuses that you hear over and over again, Ahmed Dida uh, try to use this theory, that that's probably what happened. Mm. Nonetheless, it's very clear uh, that the disciples knew that that was a resurrected Jesus. It was very clear for them that that was a resurrected Jesus. And we, we come to the, the post-resurrection appearances, number five. He showed himself to quite a few people, 15 different times in 40 days. And we know that the first person he showed himself to was a woman. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Now, why would Jesus show himself to a woman knowing that in first century Judaism, the testimony of a woman was half of that of a man, much like it is in, in Islam. That is unusual, yes. Surah 2, Ayah, 1, uh, Surah 2, Ayah 282 stipulates that the woman's testimony is half of that of a man. So was it in Judaism. Yet Jesus purposely showed himself to a woman. He could have showed himself to a man. Why did he show himself to those disciples who ran to the tomb to find him? Mm. And yet he, the tomb was empty. Yes. Jesus purposely did so knowing that the greatest event in the history of mankind was going to come from a woman. I love that because that says something about why Jesus wanted to make sure that this testimony had to come from the most distrusted source. But secondly, the second time he showed himself to was a group of women on the way to Bethany. And then to, a, to men on the way to Emmaus. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And then finally, to the ten that were in the upper room. Yes. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. So within the first day, you already see from three different parties, four different parties, he showed himself. Every one of those disciples was surprised. Thomas, a week later, refused to accept that that was Jesus standing in front of him. And until Jesus showed him the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet, he would not accept that, that was Jesus. Wow. That's why we call him Downing Thomas. Wow. I mean, just think of, put yourself in their place. What would you have done? Same thing. I mean, it would have been just amazing, overwhelming. Yeah. And that's why you, the, the um, sixth different area, which goes to these people who did see him, it changed their lives. Yes. It changed their lives. These were the same disciples who, when Jesus was being arrested, they fled. Mm. The same disciple, Peter, that when, G when he was questioned that, uh, whether or not he knew that man, three times he denied him. Yes. These were not very courageous men. These were men that were shivering and scared in the upper room. They didn't want to be seen in public. And yet Jesus showed himself to them, and it changed their lives. From men who were scared, men that were puny, men that were threatened by what they knew of Jesus Christ, to men who went and changed the world. It changed their lives. Yes. They all died for what they believe. That's right, and they weren't afraid to die. No. I mean, this is the very thing that changes everything. I mean, who's ever heard of someone dying, as simple as it is, of someone dying and then rising again from the dead? Unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. Yes. And yet the scriptures, had they looked at scripture properly, had they gone back to Isaiah, had they gone back to Psalms, they would have seen that it's right there in scripture. They should not have been surprised. And that's why the Jews till today are still waiting for the Messiah to come. If they just go back to the scripture, and look and see what the scripture says, you will, they will see that really Christ, the Messiah, did mm. come and die. And it will change their lives. It certainly changed these men's lives. And it became number seven then. It became the foundation for this new faith. Yes. Christianity lives and dies on whether Jesus died and rose again. As Paul said, if he did not rise from the dead, then we are, we are damned. We are more... Then we are still in our sin. Mm. We haven't gone an inch. In fact, our message is hopeless. We have nothing to tell the world. Mm. If Jesus, God in human form, did not die, then Romo, we might as well pack up. That's right, home. yes. If he did not rise again and fulfill what had been sent from the very beginning, because remember, the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this event was promised was prophesied when he turns to Eve and says that. It changed their lives. They became changed people, became the foundation for their faith. And everything we believe on is predicated on that event. Mm. And then the last category, just take a look and see what learned men say today. Men who doubt this, men who are, have been skeptical. And there have been many people that are skeptical. Let me just read some of their testimony. Let me just read what they say today. What they quote, Brooke Foss Westcott was a textual critic. And he said, there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dr. Paul L. Mayer, professor of ancient history, maintains that no shred of evidence has yet been discovered in literary sources, epigraphy, or archaeology that would disprove that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was actually empty on the morning of the first Easter. Simon, Dr. Simon Greenleaf, he was a, a professor at Harvard University, one of the most, probably most uh, liberal institutions, top institution that we have in the United States today. Professor of law, so he would understand law because he teaches it. He states, according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than for just about any other event in history. Now, that's hugely significant mm. when a man of his standing can say something like that. Dr. Frank Morrison, who was a rationalistic lawyer, in fact, uh, decided to take three years off from his practice to disprove the resurrection. After three years of study, he found that the sheer weight of the evidence compelled him to conclude that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. And as a consequence, he wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? You can read it today, and I would uh, encourage people to read that, that book because he goes through and he just picks apart almost like a, um, uh, like a reporter going through and asking question after question after question, and every question he asks, 
he finds an answer for. Now, it changed his life. And it's because of his research that he is the man he is today. Mm -hmm. But probably one of the best um, references we can go to is C.S. Lewis. We all know who C.S. Lewis was. I, I go down to, I love to go down to the pub where he would have, where C.S. Lewis, in fact, I was just there last week in, in Oxford, Eagle and Child, or the, um, the pub where he and J.R. Tolkien uh, would meet called the Inklings, and they would meet every Tuesday morning down there, and they would come uh, to talk about their books, they would talk about their research, they would talk about what they were writing at that time. That's where C.S. Lewis would use the others to help him to write not only the trilogy of, uh, of that hideous strength, Pyrlandra, and Out of the Silent Planet, but he also wrote the Narnia books. That's where J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the great Lord of the Rings where he, he would, they would talk about it. But what was interesting is C.S. Lewis had always been a skeptic about this very event. And it was the resurrection that changed him. And he says this, He was so interested in the accuracy of the resurrection so that after evaluating the basis and evidence for Christianity, Lewis concluded that in other religions there was no such historical claim as in Christianity. He was too experienced in literary criticism to regard the gospel as myth. He had no other choice but to accept the resurrection as fact. Wow. So, what have we done? Well, we've seen categorically that the Old Testament does speak about it. There's lots of references. Uh, we, uh, we went to the uh, references in Psalm 22, in Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, to show that the Old Testament spoke about this event. Not only that he would die first, this suffering servant would suffer first, but then he would rise again, and that he would see his offspring, and his leg days would be prolonged. We looked at the New Testament references, where Jesus talked about it in John 2, in Matthew 16, a Mark 8, and Mark 14, where Jesus not only referred to it, he talked about it to his disciples. He was preparing them. They didn't understand what was going on. It wasn't until he rose again that they saw the significance of what he'd been saying all the way along. Yes. We looked at the historical record, which is very clear, that the historians knew that that was Jesus on the cross, and even Josephus has that great reference to the fact that the Christians believe he died and rose again. And we looked at the, the empty tomb, probably the strongest piece of evidence, the fact that the body has never been found, never was found, and that the Jewish priests had to make up this rumor that uh, the, the uh, disciples had come and stolen the body without thinking through the implication of what that meant for the Praetorian Guard. And then we went and we looked at the post-resurrection appearances. Mary Magdalene, there in the morning, the women on the way to Bethany, the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, and of course, the disciples in the upper room that evening. We know of 500 people that saw Jesus yes. before he finally went up to be with God. So certainly, enormous amount of people saw him. And because of that, it changed their lives. It changed every one of their lives, so much so that these cowardly disciples were willing to die for what they believe, and every one of them died because of that event, because of what they knew about Jesus Christ. You don't die for a lie. Hmm. No, you don't create a faith, and that's the, the seventh thing. It created an entire faith. It is foundational to our faith. It is foundational to everything we believe. Without the resurrection, we're damned. Christ didn't just come to walk and talk. He didn't just come to communicate with us. He didn't just come to live amongst us. He came to die and rise again. That's right. And I just want to emphasize on that point, He changed their lives. Yeah. He changed their lives. And I know, Jay, that you've experienced that. I've experienced that. And that really is our hope and our prayer for our Christian brothers and sisters, yeah. is that Jesus Christ would change their life. And I'm not sure whether or not they've been able to look at this evidence. I don't know if they know this. I'm sure that they have not assessed or looked at the weight of evidence. It really is overwhelming. There you go. If God is who He is, and He is, He's going to leave His fingerprints for us to see. He's going to allow for us a whole lot of weight of evidence so that we will have no doubts left in our minds. I wonder what you're willing to do. What is it that you want? What, what other question is there that's on your mind? I think, Jay, you've answered the vast majority of questions that most people would ask. Would you tend to think so? Absolutely. And I, it's as a, a, one of the greatest historical facts that we have today. As yes. we said about the crucifixion, it actually did happen. So did the resurrection. Yes. Jay, thank you for your time. Always a pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you. 
We really hope for our viewers that you've been able to be challenged yet again by another episode of Midnight Cry. Please stay in tune for the very next episode and until then, may God bless you.